This is the second video where I'm discussing integration with differential forms. And in this video, I'm going to go through some real integration examples. If you haven't watched the previous video, I would highly recommend you check the link in the description and watch that one first, because if you haven't watched it, this video might not make a ton of sense. So as a reminder, the differential form interpretation of integrals tells us that every integral involves a path and a covector field, also called a differential form. And the path is indicated here with the endpoints, and the covector field, which is like a set of contour curves, is written here. And the way we compute the integral is by counting the number of covector curves that the path pierces. We add plus one when the direction of the path is aligned with the covector orientation, and we add minus one when the path is aligned in the opposite direction of the covector. And recall that the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us that the value of this integral only depends on the value of phi at the endpoints of the path a and b. And geometrically, this means that the result of the integral doesn't depend on the particular path that we take, as long as the endpoints are the same. So this is our new interpretation of integrals. Let's go through a couple of examples to see how it compares with our old interpretation of integrals that involves areas under curves. So this integral is an example of a path integral in the 2D plane, and this one is just an ordinary single variable integral in the x direction. So let's start with this one. So in our old interpretation of integrals, we would be taking the line negative 6x plus 4 and finding the area between it and the x-axis, between x equals 0 and x equals 2. So this area here would be positive, and this area here would be negative. So to compute it, we just go ahead and compute the antiderivative, which is negative 3x squared plus 4x, and evaluate it at the endpoints of 2 and 0. And if we do that, we get negative 12 plus 8, which is equal to negative 4. So now let's try computing it with the new interpretation with differential forms. So we have this integral with our path endpoints and our differential form. So this expression right here can be viewed as the derivative of some function f with respect to x. And so all of this can be rewritten as just df. So this integral here is really simple if we can just figure out what f is, right? It would just be f of 2 minus f of 0 by the fundamental theorem of calculus. So if df by dx is negative 6x plus 4, to get f of x, we just compute the antiderivative, which is negative 3x squared plus 4x plus some constant c. Now if we want to visualize f, we could draw it as a curve like this. And it doesn't really matter what the constant c is, so I'm just going to pick c equals 1 arbitrarily, but it doesn't really matter either way. I'm just picking something so that we can graph it. So here f is visualized as a curve drawn on a pair of axes. But we could also visualize f as a scalar field like we've done here, where red indicates positive values and blue is negative values. So this is the scalar field f, and that means that the covector field df would be the level sets of f, oriented towards the positive values. So this is the covector field df, and in this case, our path would go from x equals 0 to x equals 2. So let's just draw this path here. And as you can see, we get plus 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, and minus 1. So we cancel this plus 1 with this minus 1, and we see that the total value is negative 4, which is exactly what we got before. So the answer we get by taking a path and looking at how many contour curves it pierces is the same answer we get by looking at the area underneath the curve. Now let's take the example of this other integral. So notice that we have both x and y variables here, so this integral involves a path p in the 2D plane. And this path is parameterized by a time parameter t that goes from 0 to 2. The path's x-coordinate is equal to 1 half t plus 1, and the path's y-coordinate is equal to 3 over 2t minus 1. So the path would look like this. At t equals 0, we start at the point plus 1 minus 1, and at time t equals 2, we end up at the point 2, 2. So the normal way to compute this is to expand the differentials dx and dy in terms of dt. So we can use the formulas dx equals dx by dt times dt, and dy equals dy by dt times dt. Now to get all of this in terms of t, we can grab y from here, and the derivative of x with respect to t is just 1 half, as we can see here, 
Also, we can grab x from here, and the derivative dy by dt is just 3 over 2, as we can see here. So adding these two terms together, we get the integral of 6 over 4t plus 1 dt. And to compute this, we figure out the antiderivative, which is 3 over 4t squared plus t, and evaluate it at the endpoints 0 and 2. Evaluating at 2, we get 3 over 4 times 2 squared plus 2. And evaluating at 0 just gives us 0, so we can ignore that part. So this just ends up being 3 plus 2, which is equal to 5. So that's the old way of doing things. Let's try doing the integral using the differential form interpretation instead. So we start off with the same integral with the same path, and our goal is now to turn this sum of covector fields into a single covector field df. So how are we going to do that? Well, remember, we can expand df in terms of dx and dy like this, using these partial derivatives. And this expression here looks pretty similar to the one we have up here, right? So we're going to have to take this expression here, y dx plus x dy, and write it in this format here, partial f by partial x times dx plus partial f by partial y times dy. So obviously this means that partial f by partial x has to be equal to y, and likewise partial f by partial y has to be equal to x. So we need to figure out some function f which satisfies these equations here. And this function does exist, it's simply f is equal to x times y plus some constant. And you can check that these derivatives work out. So now we have our function f, which is like a scalar field, and this scalar field looks like this. Here we're using the special case where the constant c is equal to zero, but it really doesn't matter which value of c we use. So we have positive scalar values where x and y have the same sign, and negative scalar values where x and y have opposite signs. So if this is the scalar field f, we can get the covector field df just by looking at its level sets. So this would be the level sets of f, with the black arrows pointing in the positive direction, and this covector field is called df. And if we put this path here and count how many contour curves it pierces, we get a total of 5, which is exactly what we expect. And if we do things algebraically and evaluate the differential df using the fundamental theorem of calculus, all we need to do is subtract the value of f at the endpoints of the path which are at t equals 2 and t equals 0. And if we plug in those values of t into the path equations, the corresponding xy points are 2, 2, and plus 1, minus 1. And evaluating at those points, we just use the function f of xy is equal to x times y, so we get 2 times 2 minus 1 times negative 1, which again is equal to 5, which is exactly what we expect. So what we've shown here is that there's a new way to think about these integrals. Instead of thinking of integrals in terms of computing an area under a curve, we're thinking about them in terms of a covector field and a path, and just counting the number of covector curves that the path pierces. And as I mentioned in the last video, this interpretation is really nice because it doesn't depend on any coordinate systems. These paths and covector fields are geometric objects that don't depend on our choice of coordinates. So it doesn't matter if we're using Cartesian coordinates or polar coordinates or whatever else we choose, the result of the integral will always be the same. And I'd like to show you what I mean by that. So earlier I showed that with this integral, if we assume that this expression is the derivative of f with respect to x, then we can compute the antiderivative to get this expression here. And this scalar field f looks like this. Or if you prefer, we could graph it as a function like this. So what would happen if we were to change coordinates? And you might be wondering what I mean by changing coordinates since we're only dealing with one dimensional space. Well, basically I just mean that we do a change of variables. So what would happen if I do a change of variables where u is equal to 2x, or equivalently x is equal to 1 half u? Well, this expression negative 6x plus 4 would become negative 3u plus 4, and since x is equal to 1 half u, we also have dx is equal to 1 half du. And finally, these endpoints of x equals 0 and x equals 2 would become u equals 0 and u equals 4. So this entire integral would become negative 3u plus 4 times 1 half du, going from u equals 0 to u equals 4.
and distributing out the one half, we'd get negative 1.5 u plus two du. So after this change of variables, we get this integral here. And if we write this expression as df by du, then the antiderivative f as a function of u would be this function here. And if we like, we can also visualize this function as a scalar field or a curve. And you'll notice that these pictures here are exactly identical. The only difference is that in the first image, we measure things using the x-coordinate system. And in the second image, we measure things using the u-coordinate system. So even though that the numbers that appear in these integrals look different, the underlying geometry here, the underlying scalar field is the same. The only thing we've changed is the measuring sticks that we're using. And if the scalar field F is the same in both cases, that means that the covector field DF is also the same in both cases. And the path that travels from X equals zero to X equals two is the exact same as the path that travels from U equals zero to U equals four. So since the covector field and the path are the same in both cases, the result of the integral, which is negative four, is also the same in both cases. So the fundamental underlying geometry here is the covector field df, and we can choose to expand df in terms of the x variable or the u variable. And we might get a bunch of different numbers when we use x compared to when we use u, but at the end of the day, these are just two different ways of describing the covector field df. So df doesn't depend on any coordinate system. So this covector field df is purely geometrical, and it doesn't depend on the coordinate system we choose to use. Now let's go through the other example. So here we have a path integral over a 2D space where this is the path. And recall we wrote the integrand out like this and deduced that the function f had to be equal to x times y plus some constant c that didn't really matter. And visualizing this scalar field f looks like this. And for simplicity, I'm using c equals zero here, but it doesn't really matter which value we use. Now let's try changing coordinates from the xy variable to the uv variables, where u equals 2x and v equals 2y. So this means that x is equal to 1 half u and y is equal to 1 half v, which also means that dx is equal to 1 half du and dy is equal to 1 half dv. So we would get that the new integral would look like this, which ends up being 1 quarter v du plus 1 quarter u dv. And we would also need to reparameterize the path to be in terms of u and v instead of x and y. So if you work all that out, we end up with u is equal to t plus 2 and v is equal to 3t minus 2. So you'll notice that the numbers in the covector field got smaller, but the numbers in the path got bigger. And we'll find that the combination of these getting smaller and these getting bigger sort of cancel out so that the result stays the same. So writing all this out, again, we look for the underlying function f that describes this expression, and we end up with f of u and v is equal to 1 quarter u times v plus some constant k. And visualizing this function, we'd get this scalar field here. And again, I'm using k equals 0 for simplicity. It really doesn't matter what we use. And the new path, parameterized in terms of u and v, would look like this. So you'll notice that once again, the scalar field and the path look the exact same in both cases. The only thing that's changed is the measuring sticks that we're using. So if the scalar field F is the same in both cases, that means that the covector field DF is also the same in both cases. And so the result of both of these integrals is five because they use the same path and same covector field. So once again, this covector field DF is a geometric object that doesn't depend on our choice of coordinate system. We can choose to expand df into different sets of variables, like x and y, or u and v. And the coefficients that result from these variable choices might look different, but at the end of the day, these are just two different ways of describing the covector field df. These are both really just describing the same thing. And this is really the main point I want to get across in this video. Covector fields are invariant to the choice of coordinates but the covector field components do depend on the choice of coordinates. So this is just like when we're dealing with simple vectors. If we take this yellow vector V and try measuring it using different sets of basis vectors, using this blue set, we'll get the components one, 1.5. But using this red set of basis vectors, we get the components one, two. And if we use this green set of basis vectors, we get the components 1.25, 0.25. 
And with this purple set, we get the components 0, 1. So this is the same vector v in all these cases. We're not changing the vector, but when we change basis, we end up describing the vector using different numbers or different components. So the vector itself is invariant, but the components are not invariant. They depend on the basis. And it's the same thing with covector fields in integrals. We can have some integral like this with this covector field and then change variables and get another covector field that looks totally different. And we can change variables again and get yet another covector field that looks different and change variables again and get something that's even more different. But really, all of these expressions are describing the same covector field df. It's just that in each of these four cases, we've expanded the covector field differently using different variables, and so we've gotten different components. So this expression is really just df by dx, and this is df by du, and this is df by dy, and this is df by ds. So we get different components in each case because we're using a different coordinate system in each case. But at the end of the day, these all describe the same covector field df, which is invariant to the choice of coordinates. And the same thing goes for the path. All these endpoints are just different ways of describing the same path p with different coordinate systems. So in summary, just as we can expand the same vector in different coordinate systems and end up with different components each time, we can also expand the same covector field using different variables and get different components each time. But at the end of the day, vectors are just arrows and covector fields are just level sets. These are all geometric objects that don't depend on any coordinate system. So the main takeaway of this video is that covector fields are invariant to the choice of coordinates. And that's why when we change the variable in an integral, we still get the same answer. Because integration isn't really about the choice of variable that we use, it's just about crossing covector curves using a path. But covector field components do depend on the choice of coordinates. So when we look at integrals using different variables, we're going to see different numbers, even if the underlying covector field and path we're describing is the same.